I'm Martin Rzeźnicki. I work for uh, the iterators. We are a Warsaw-based Scala consultancy company, so you can check us out. And uh, having said that, uh, today I'll be talking about Idris for practical slash impractical Scala programmers. But uh, you might be asking yourselves what Idris is, uh, why do we need to compare these two, what's unique in what Idris does. So for one thing, Idris is famous for its uh, value-dependent type system. But what that actually is? Is it good for a contemporary Scala programmer? Uh, is it something worth knowing? That's the thing that I'll try to explain. Well, the other thing is that uh, there was this talk yesterday uh, that Mr. Brodowski gave. I'm not sure if he's in the audience. Uh, where he was making a point that I very strongly agree with, which is that we shouldn't write Java in Scala. Well, uh, I might try to take it a bit further. Maybe we could try to write Idris, whatever that Idris is, in Scala. Well, that question let it remain open. I might be trying to give you some examples to show you if it's, if it's okay, if it's beneficial, but you'll have to, uh, you'll have to answer it for yourself, basically. All right, so to kick it off, um, there is this quote I very strongly agree with. It's been attributed to a, a lot of people throughout the years, but its actual author is uh, American psychologist Kurt Lewin, um, who in the uh, 40s coined this, this slogan that there is nothing more practical than a good theory. So let's step back a bit and start with a bit of theory that will help you to understand what are the possibilities. What can we expect of type system theoretically? Uh, what's the scale of expressiveness and where are the type systems of languages that we, uh, we happen to use in our day-to-day -day job, uh, where they are on the scale of expressiveness? Also, we need to uh, think about what's the, where is this point of impracticality or practicality on the scale of expressiveness, because it's not always the case, or should I say it's rarely the case that we want the most expressive type system that's possible. Uh, we rather not, because it's always a trade-off. If type system gets more expressive, then there are usually some guarantees that are lost. For instance, type inference might not work in this type system, or type checking times might become uh, unbounded. So it's always a trade-off. We need to. Uh, we don't want the most expressive type system possible. We want the most expressive type system we can live with, basically. All right, so um, there are two tools uh, that can be used to explore this landscape of type system. Well, there are, there are more than two, but uh, there are two that I want to talk about now. One is uh, called Lambda Cube. It's basically a visual presentation of, um, of type system families. The other is um, mathematical abstraction or theory framework, if you will called pure type systems. Uh, sometimes it's called generalized type system theory. So uh, let's start with lambda cube. Uh, well, lambda cube is basically just this. It's a drawing of a cube. Well, the idea here is that if you traverse this cube in different directions, you add, or, or should I say, you mix some abstractions and thus you form new type families. Well, what these abstractions are, or basically these are abstractions, well, informally speaking, these are uh, mutual dependencies that are allowed or disallowed between things that type system operate on, which is terms and types. By saying terms, I mean things like variables, constants, uh, functions, functional applications, and so on and so on. So uh, to give you a notion of what I'm talking about, uh, you can have, for instance, I'm not sure if code is that visible. Slides are online, uh, so you, you might you know, uh, check them online. So uh, the very basic dependency you can allow, you want to have in your, system, in your type system, is dependency of term. You can allow term to depend on other term. 
So what that is, uh, there are examples uh, in Scala, that's the upper one, and in Idris, that's the uh, lower one, um, of what you can express when you have only this dependency. So uh, when term can depend on term, you can have only this. You can have functions, uh, possibly higher order functions. You can have variables, constants, and so on, so on. But uh, so computational-wise, it's more or less like lambda calculus. It is lambda calculus. But type-wise, you don't have much. You can only form a function type, basically, out of this type system. So even though you can compute anything using only this dependency, uh, you can compute anything that's computable, but you have no real types. So if you allow a uh, term to depend on type, and what you get is a parametric polymorphism, basically. So you can have functions like identity function, uh, I don't know, which works for any type. Uh, you can have, so it's an Id identity here is a term, and it depends on, on type A. Um, you can have function like twice, which calls any other function twice, and so on, so on. So that's what you get, parametric polymorphism, basically. If you allow a type to depend on type, what you get is, or are type constructors. You can form elaborate types. You can form things like function one, which is a function type that is a type, the type constructor depends on two types. You can have a list type, for instance. You can have higher order types, like here, uh, in that's taken from cats, uh, invariant type, which takes other type constructor and so on, or you can have functor type and so on and so on. And when you allow type to depend on term, well, that's where it gets, uh, well that's where it gets really interesting. That's what basically this talk is about. So when you allow this, you can form uh, types like uh, here we have a vector type. It's a type constructor. It takes type and uh, creates another type, what you would expect of vector or list. But in addition, it can take a natural number, a simple term. And the idea here is that this natural number encodes length of this vector. So you have a type called vector which depends on a term, which is a natural number like five, six, seven. Well, you might not know this because it's a bit obscure in Scala, but in Scala it's possible as well. So when you take a look at this upper example, um, you can have a, a uh, return type of the function that depends on its argument. What I that's what we call a uh, dependent method in basically Scala. So this, d the type that this function will return will change accordingly to whatever argument you pass, and this argument needs to uh, have this um, this, this type inside that will eventually end up as a return type. So these are the abstractions we can form. And the idea is that if you start at the lower, um, at the bottom left a corner of the cube, and that if you travel to the right, you add uh, type to term dependencies, meaning dependent typing. If you travel upwards in this cube, you add uh, type constructors. If you, uh, sorry, a parametric polymorphism. If you travel to the back uh, of this cube, you add parametric polymorphism. And as you form various type families, we can, uh, we can discuss. Now, uh, this is the part I usually skip because uh, I don't have that much time. I'll just, uh, as I said, slides are online. Uh, so you can, you can, think, you can uh, check out about the theory behind it. Uh, but the highlights of, of pure type systems theory is that it's very generic. It can describe types that are not on the lambda cube, that are somewhere beyond the lambda cube. But it can also describe all the types that are on this cube. For instance, and that's the point in the case where that I made um, that you don't always want the most expressive type system. For instance, one type system derivable from the theory is so-called system U. Um, well, system U is, is really powerful and expressive type system. It's so powerful that in this type system, every type is inhabitable, has a member. Why is that a wrong thing? Well, there is this mathematical theory which is called Curry-Howard isomorphism you might have heard of. Now, 
uh, this theory says that uh, computer programs are basically representation, can be thought of as representation of some logic system. And under this representation, a type is a proposition. And if you're able to form a computation leading to a value of this type, then you have just proven that this proposition holds. This computation can take some arguments, and these arguments will be basically a hypothesis of, uh, of this theorem that this type represents. So if you think about this correspondence, then obviously some things should not be provable, right? So some types should be, should remain uninhabited. For instance, a type of function from A to B for any A and B. Well, that should be, if you think about it, that should be an inhabited type, right? Why? Because uh, that means in logic, in, in, in language of logic, that means that if I know something, I'll know anything else. Well, that shouldn't be really provable. If you think of it as a, as of a programming task, if I task you writing a function that takes arbitrary A, argument of type A, and needs to return some unrelated type B, then how would you implement it? You can't, right? So uh, under this correspondence, this is an inhibited type, and that's good. There are other examples, like uh, if you're given a, uh, a function from A to A, and I task you returning A, right? So how would you produce, given only a function from A to A, how would you produce A? Well, you can't. You can only call this function on, uh, on itself, thus forming unbounded recursion, so this computation will never end. And that's sometimes used as a representation of false, this A in constructivist logic, A to A to A. So these are uninhabited types, but in system U, all types are inhabited. You can create types out of thin air which means that logical reasoning in this type system is totally meaningless. And, but th that's a very, very expressive type system. So you don't want this kind of type system. What you, uh, what you want, let's, let's, let's think about what we want. Um, I'll skip the boring parts, you can check them uh, online. <laughs> but um, let's say we start at the, uh, at the, ver ver at the uh, lower left, corner of the cube where we have the very basic type system which is typed lambda calculus. In this type system only type, uh, I'm sorry, only term on term dependencies are allowed. So these are the examples of computation you, uh, computations you can uh, derive uh, in this type system. So basically, um, as I said before, you, ca you have the full power of lambda calculus so you can compute anything computable, but there are no real types in this type system. The only type that is there is a function type. And there is no polymorphism whatsoever. Right? So this is not really practical type system. No one in their right mind would like to program in pure lambda calculus. We need to have at least some real types. So to have the real types, type constructors, we need to, as I said, move to the back of the cube where we obtain somewhat a strange system called uh, lambda omega. Why is this uh, system strange? Well, this type system uh, enables term uh, to depend on term and type to depend on type. So you can form elaborate types, very complicated types. You can uh, form types like either ID type list and whatnot. But because there is no and these two words cannot mix. Only dependencies are out are type on type and term on term. So even though you can have arbitrary complex computations and arbitrary complex types, you cannot mix them. So even though I can have a list of anything, I cannot write a function under this type system that computes the length of list of any. I can just compute a length of list of int, a length of list of I know, doubles and so on, so on. So that's a really strange type system. It's, um, I wouldn't call it practical either. So we need some kind of a generic polymorphism or parametric polymorphism. We need some kind of polymorphism. Uh, so we need to be able to mix these two worlds, worlds of terms and types. So for this, we need to move upwards uh, on the lambda cube where we have two somewhat famous uh, type system called system F and system F omega. Why are they famous? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, Hindley-Milner type system we probably all, all heard of 
is a, a subset of system F. Uh, so in this type system, system F and system F omega, system F omega is sometimes known as, now bear with me, a higher order polymorphic typed lambda calculus. <laughs> that, is, that is name. So under this type systems you can ha you have anything you're used to. Uh, well, you can you have even more because there is the lambda calculus there on the type level. You can have arbitrarily complex, possibly unbounded type transformations. So this is so powerful type system that the languages we use, like Scala and Haskell, even though their type systems are based on this type system, they deliver slightly less than that. Why is that? For instance, type inference is a decidable uh, problem in F omega type system. Also, because as I said, while uh, we have a full lambda calculus at the type level, then we can obviously have unbounded recursion at the type level, meaning the type checking might never end in this type system. Uh, because of these problems, uh, the, these programming languages, you know, regular, so to say, programming languages deliver slightly less than this type system usually. Um, well, uh, for instance, um, there is uh, something called higher rank polymorphism. Uh, well, maybe I'll describe it uh, using an example. So, let's say we have a function for any a, we have a function that forms a tuple a and a. Basically, it, it doubles its argument, packs its argument into a tuple. So, because this function poses no constraints on uh, the type it receives, then uh, we would like to use it in any context, right? There are no constraints whatsoever. So we think that we could uh, write a function that takes this function as an argument and takes something of possibly unrelated type, calls it, uh, calls this function with this argument of possibly unrelated type, but it should be possible because there are no constraints on what type this, this doubling, this tuppling function takes and uh, basically forms a tuple, right? returns its result. But it won't compile in Scala. Why is that? Uh, because, uh, well, informally speaking, uh, Scala insists on, on quantifying types at the earliest possible, in the earliest possible moment, so to say. So what Scala sees is that you want two type parameters, A and B, they are unrelated, and then you have a function from A and you feed it with B, which is for Scala a different type, then, well, sorry, compilation error. In some fictional Scala that would have had higher polymorphism, we, I'm not sure if that's visible, but um, we would like this type A to be quantified only at the level of this one single argument, because that's where it matters. So we would like this function pair to only take real wa one real type parameter B, and this A should be just in, you know, in the context of this one argument, but that's not possible in Scala. Well, there are workarounds. It's possible in Idris, though. If you observe here, uh, we can restrict this type parameter to just, uh, to just one single function argument, and it would work, but the you know, rank three polymorphism is not achievable in Idris as well, and so on and so on. So there are workarounds around this. You can use partial um, application trig, you can use natural transformation, or function class sometimes called. So you can write it in Scala, but this is the definition of higher rank polymorphism in system F and system F omega is possible, in Scala is not possible, so Scala doesn't have full power of system F or F omega. Um, well, there are all crazy stuff in this type system because of its expressiveness, you can form a theory at type level, you can prove that, for instance, A and B implies A or implies B at the type level and so on and so on, you can write on the, on the type level, you can write anything like this in system F and system F omega. Uh, check the slides, please, if you, if you have time. Um, but even though I said that we have such a powerful type system that we need to somehow limit its expressiveness in, in for practical purposes, then there are still some deceivingly simple things we cannot express 
types, even given this how powerful types. Is. For instance, uh, as, ma as I mentioned before, collections of known length. Well, that's that seems like a really practical thing, right? Uh, we would like compiler to check for us whether we are not, you know, indexing beyond the collection. That looks uh, very practical, but still we cannot express it under this this very powerful type system. Or, for instance, let's say we have a t we want to have a type of date where range of day is restricted according to month. Well, that's a fact of life, right? That's how it is. But we cannot express this simple fact using our uh, our well f-like type systems. Or a functions like print, for instance. That's a very interesting case. So um, functions like print at some level, or print, can be thought of as a function, sorry, uh, as a function from string to string, right? But we know that it's not really the case because this string argument to we pass to print has its internal structure, which really changes what we operate on, right? So if we pass a sprint function something like percent %s equals percent %d, what we're really dealing with is a function from string to int to string, right? And if our format string is something like percent %s is percent %s, then we have a function from string to string to string, right? So uh, this is, you know, a very common programming uh, thing functions like spread, but still we can express them uh, under the type systems we are used to, or something like compile time balancers or you know state machines that are uh, that checked at compile time. These are very real things, but we cannot express them, and we would really like to now. Who would not want a collections of known length or type safe sprints? But now that we are not able to express them, or are we? That's maybe the question. But now, whether this type safety, this additional type safety, is worth the effort of you know adapting it in languages that do not intrinsically support it, like Scala. And even if it is possible, then is it worth the additional cost in development or maintenance, or you know just the mental balance we will? Uh, will suffer from using the solutions. Well, uh, that's what we uh, what we need to discuss. Now, about this, uh, about is it possible? Well, when I was researching this uh, this topic, I came across a uh, Scala uh, Stack Overflow discussion, where uh, Miles Sabin said that the combination of uh, unique Scala features like singleton types, path dependent types, um, implicits means that Scala has a surprisingly good support for dependent typing. Well, if that's what Miles Sabin, who is a, a titan of, of Scala world, if that's what he states, then at the very least we should consider it possible. At the very least, right? So, well, let's check how we can simulate this dependent typing world in the Scala world and how far we can, we can get. So, um, I'll be not comparing uh, various, you don't have to learn it, it's just, I'll just explain these examples a bit. Uh, I'll just try to see how far we can get, how, what dependent value problems we can solve in Scala. I, in, the very s the in, the, in the technical sense of the word, the very simplest dependent type is a type that depends on an enumeration on a concrete small set of values. Like we have this type vehicle here in Idris, and it depends on a value of its power source, which can be either a petrol, a pedal, or um, electric. So we have, a, a technically, we have dependent type uh, with additional constraint that, let's say, we have a refuel operation which only can uh, work in context of petrol-based um, vehicles. And, well, if you think about it, that's the that's the idea that really object-oriented programming is for. Well, you could even say that object-oriented programming is a very special instance of dependent uh, type of dependency typed language where dependencies are restricted to enumerations. Let's see how. So, 
we have a, a lot of options in Scala that we can use to encode this. Scala is even more, or Scala -like languages are even more expressive uh, in this regard than a purely dependency type language. For instance, we can encode all these dependencies as subtypes. We can form a pedal vehicle, electric vehicle, petrol vehicle, and so on, so on. Then restricting one operation, say refuel, to only petrol-based vehicles is really natural. We just put there in, in its corresponding subtype, right? Uh, there is uh, one problem with this approach, and this problem is visible uh, in all uh, in both examples. So, say, how would you uh, form a uh, hybrid vehicle, the one which depends on which uh, power source is either uh, you know petrol or electric? Well, Idris is Haskell-like language, so you can do it in Idris, but you need to you need to go to very advanced techniques like type classing and so on, so on. But not so much in object-oriented language, which Scala partially is, right? We can just use mixings. We can uh, just encode uh, each and every of these dependencies as a trait, and then we can mix an arbitrary number of them in, into one type, thus forming a hybrid vehicles easily and any other types of vehicles, and still r restricting one operation, say refuel, to only uh, to only a subset of these types is as natural and as easy as it was in the, in the previous example. So we have more options in Scala uh, to encode the very simplest dependent types. We can even uh, do something more sophisticated. We can, if we don't want to somehow contaminate this type, um, uh, this vehicle type with uh, with its power source, we can encode this as a, as a phantom type. This is a technique in Scala which we just have a type parameter that's not that doesn't have any runtime uh, representation. It's, it's just used for type checker as a trait. So we can do it, uh, we can encode it like this, and then uh, due to these being sealed traits, we can write refuel operations to, uh, to be accessible only for a petrol-based uh, vehicles, and exhaustiveness uh, check will still work. So we can write it as well. So we have so many options to encode this kind of dependencies in Scala. But it's, uh, I would say that Scala wins in this example. But then, can we go further? Um, so, for instance, Idris is known of its uh, arithmetic at type level. Can we encode natural numbers at the type level? So, natural numbers are uh, an answer is, I'll say in advance, yes, we can. So, the natural number is uh, can be encoded as a very simple, and that's how it's represented in dependency type systems. It's a very simple. A recursive type. It's either a zero or successor or some other number. Sometimes it's called a church encoding. And uh, well, this structure we can form in Scala very easily. We just uh, encode this recursion at the type level as type uh, parameters with appropriate constraints and subclassing. So we create a generic type. It has appropriate type constructors with appropriate type constraints. And that's how we encode recursion at type level. Um, basically, in that uh, in Scala, and we also need a uh, type member that carries the structure. This should be really structure and result structure of this type. I'll show later how it's useful, and then we can form a singleton types. Uh, by saying singleton types, I mean types that have only one possible member of this type that represents zero, one, two, three, and whatnot. That is isomorphic to, uh, nat to natural numbers. We can create values of these types, and compiler will know this structure. It will know that, say, for instance, three is a successor of a successor of successor of zero. But then, so we are able to do this, even do this in Scala. But then, um, well, in Idris there are two things, or in every dependent type uh, system there are two things. So for, for first of all, natural numbers can be mixed with regular numbers with uh, literals with constants and so on so on and the other thing is that like in this head example here these natural numbers the type level natural numbers can be used to restrict some operations for instance we can specify that things like head or tail function can be only called on vectors that have at least one element at the compile time so we need to be able to do something like like this, we, we need to be able to use it uh, as in, in type signature. Can we do this? Well, let's start with representing a literal. So 
that's where it gets a bit problematic. So, um, well, if we restrict ourselves to constants, basically to literals, then we can just write a macro that will create instance of our type level integer. It will just take a constant number and will apply successor type, the possible implement, and we will apply the possible implementation of this macro, will apply successor type constructor as many times as needed. So we can we can represent literals, uh, regular integer literals in this way, but then you can ask how about our variables? Oh well we we can think we are smart and write the simple recursive function that will uh, compute in our natural number from integer literal, simply recursively. But if you think about it, it doesn't give us anything. First of all, we still cannot use this because there is no pattern matching or anything at type level in Scala. We still cannot use this variable natural number anywhere where you would like it to be used. But maybe more important thing is that there is something which is called no type preservation here. What does it mean? Um, well, if this function can only return something like generic natural number, meaning that we lose its structure. Compiler only knows that it's a okay, it's a generic natural number with some representation n, but it doesn't know what this representation is. Losing this structure, we are opening a can of worms. This slide is actually very important to understanding this, but I'll, I'll go back to this later. So for now, let's just limit ourselves to constants. All right? So if we limited ourselves to, to, in, to constants, then we can formulate a more elaborate types. We can formulate, for instance, type of integers bounded, of bounded integers by some number. Um, I won't maybe bother you with details if you're interested, just check the slides, but it's a more complicated type, uh, which has more complicated recursion type level, which depends on integer, but we already know how to represent integers at type level, so we can use this knowledge. We can use the same technique of simulating type level recursion, um, meaning we encode uh, all dependencies as type parameters, and we encode all the constructors by subclassing, adding appropriate constraints. So then we can formulate very complex types in this manner at the type level that represent things that we usually attach to runtime. But then uh, the thing is, what's good to have uh, all these types if we can't do anything with them? We need to be able to lift computation on these types to type level as well. So we need to be able to form arbitrary, com oh, I'm sorry, arbitrary computations on them. For instance, converting them and so on and so on, that doesn't look really easy. But in fact, it is in Scala. So if you take any function, you know, the regular value level function, you just lift and code it as a type. You get, you, you take all the arguments and code it as Type members. You take result type and code it as type member with appropriate constraint. And thus you lifted computation to a type. This type is, well, really represents this recursive function. Then you use some tricks to encode result type to say that uh, this fun if this function returns, then uh, for argument f, its result is of type n. And in this way, you lifted all these arbitrary complex computations to type level. And you can they will happen at compile time and will state what you want. Um, time is running out, but um, the very, uh, maybe the, the, the most important thing here is, but all right, so I lifted the signature of a computation to a type level. How do I lift, uh, you know, the real stuff that's going on? Well, there is one mechanism that's unique to Scala, I would say, which enables us to do it. Compiler performs computations, right? For instance, type unification, but that's set in stone. We cannot use it to our purpose. It does what it does. We cannot control it. But there is one mechanism during that happens at compile time in Scala which we can use to encode uh, uh, computations. That's implicit search. So we use implicit search, as in this example, to drive this computation at compile time to compute whatever we want and form more and more complex computations recursively. 
So basically, does it take we can do, and by using uh, depend we can do that, and by using uh, dependent types, which I mentioned before, which are uh, available in Scala, we can preserve the structure. So for instance, we can preserve that this natural number is a successor of successor of zero and so on so on throughout all these computations. So we do not lose any information in the process. So these are the unique Scala features that we use, that we can use to lift our almost arbitrary computations at time level. So using this, um, so using this, we can create a poster child of dependent typing in Scala, of vectors or collections of known length. It's perfectly possible using all these techniques I mentioned before. Um, just check the slides if you're interested. But and sometimes we can we need to be a little bit creative because there are things which we cannot do. We need to simulate pattern matching at type level. But eventually we discovered that we can simulate pattern matching at type level in Scala as well. We can create computations by using implicit search that will unapply types for them, destructure them, and uh, you know retrieve the relevant inter information at type level. So everything like everything. We talked before is perfectly possible in Scala. Its type system is expressive enough to express this complicated stuff. But oh, and uh, well, what's the result? The result is that uh, if I created a vector of I don't know two elements, then I just can't say tail, tail, tail of this vector. It would be a compile time error. I can just go as far as the type of this vector allows. I can take a tail of its head because it has two elements that's, uh, that's the um, um, that's correct but I can't go too far because that will be a compilation error compilation error all right um, so you might be thinking that it's uh, everything is, is perfectly possible in Scala but then you will notice that I'm out uh, cheating a bit uh, by s you know, all these collections I we dealt with have they ranked statically known so far but most of the use cases for collections are for collections which length is unknown. They are, I don't know, they come from database or come from, um, I don't know, JSON deserialization, and we do not know the length of them in advance. But if we just made length of the collection as a part of its type, and we do not know the length, is it, is it a bit problematic because we can even form the type? And it's not an unsolvable problem. It turns out that in dependent uh, type systems theory, there is an, a tool uh, for dealing with this kind of stuff. It's called a sigma type. Well, the better name, the more expressive name, or, you know, uh, yeah, the more expressive name, I guess, is a dependent pair. We could call it dependent pair. The idea is that it's a pair where the first element of this pair is some information and the other is a type that follows this information. So for instance, I can have a pair which, uh, of which first element is, an, uh, is a natural number, and the other will be a vector that's parameterized that has the length of this number. Uh, and then I wouldn't be able to do anything with this pair unless I assert something about its first element. If I deconstructure the first element, so if I determine that it's a uh, I don't know, uh, two or three, then the type checker will automatically know that its second argument is vector of length two or three. So that's how it works in practice. So if you call filter on list like one, two, three, filter is even, for instance, then the dependent, the Idris in dependent type system type checker doesn't magically know that the answer is the, is the uh, list of length one. It doesn't, it cannot. It just uses different type to represent this computation, this, this list of unknown length. And it won't allow you to do anything with the result unless you check it. It's basically that it's forcing you to make, well, if length is two, then I can do this. It's basically like it is. That's how expressive type checkers in dependent type systems are. Can we do that in Scala? Well, sigma type can be expressed in Scala technically, but then, uh, and yeah, I can I can do in Scala things like this. I can create a pair of which first element is a type level two. Then I cannot put uh, three element vector as its second element. It won't compile. But remember this slide. 
Once you are really in a variable world and you lose this singleton structure, then you, s I can, you can determine that it's true what I'm saying by using some reflection trick. It uh, really doesn't matter. But if you lose the singleton structure, then suddenly compiler, uh, nothing will compile. Because compiler won't know what to assert. It won't be able to reconstruct this type level structure from variable. And that's the difference between Idris or dependency type languages and Scala. In these systems, a type checker know how to reconstruct a type from variable. It's always possible. In Scala, it isn't. So even though it's expressible in Scala, it's not really practical. The most common use case for collections of the collections of unknown length, and this we, well, even if we technically can represent, we can do nothing with them in Scala. Well, but the cases, um, I'm wrapping it up, uh, there are cases where it's more practical, say this print example. Well, print in dependency type languages, you know, is as value dependent thing as you'll see in your life. It can take a string at compile time or at runtime, it doesn't matter. It's just the value world and the type worlds are the same in this kind of system. So we can take a string, parse it to some algebraic data type, and then from this algebraic data type, it will determine the real type of print. It's as value dependent thing as you'll see in your life. So the type of print from person S equals person D is string into string and so on, so on, so on. So value is seamlessly lifted into type level uh, in this kind of systems. Can we do that in Scala? Well, from what I said, there is the bridge you can't cross. You can cross it with macro, going from string to the exact type. There is one thing you can't cross. But in cases like print, it doesn't hurt that much. Because why? Because f and um, from this, if you have an algebraic data structure, then using the techniques I showed you, you can achieve the same thing. You can achieve a type of print following the structure, being the exact type of, of format structure being passed to it. And the bridge you can cross. Um, well, if you in the cases like print, it doesn't hurt. Because format strings to print are effectively constant. You do not lose much if you do not allow them to be variables. So you can m use macros to lift value to a structure. And from this structure, you can use pure, pure Scala code to have a very, very precise type. And you won't cry that much of because you're not able to use variable format strings because, well, they are effectively constant in, program, uh, effect constant in programming practice. So in this case, it is practical. There are more cases like this. Things that are known, effectively known at compile time, like state machines, protocols, print-like cases, they can be described using um, dependent types. You can have very precise types. And well, if you use it, I guess it's an open question. Up to you. I think that's the end of it, right? Thank you very much.